So hi everybody on Zoom and hello everyone in person. Thanks for braving the weather to get here. This is really gonna be worth it. Um, so as everyone probably knows, I'm Anna Marie, community manager in Denver. We kind of have two points of uh, the programming events. One is to get to know someone new or to deepen the connection that you already have. And the second one is to learn something new. So um, on that note, we're just gonna do a quick introduction. I know there's not a ton of us in here, but just kind of give us your name, what you do, and then um, we'll hand it over to Lori after that. So, who here likes public speaking? Okay. I've got a couple hands here in Denver, and those of you in St. Louis, maybe share with each other in the chat. Who here, I already saw Annie, does not like it? Doesn't like it, maybe he's a little afraid, gets his butterflies, gets a little nervous. <laughs> Anyone doesn't like it? And who's just kind of, eh, whatever. If you make me do it, I'll do it, but I don't really want to. Okay. If you have any fear about public speaking, you are not alone. A 2014 Gallup poll that surveyed Americans found that fear of public speaking was the number one fear of all Americans. Can you guess what number two is? Anyone? I think mine felt about it. It's like cliff jumping or something. Okay, so we got cliff jumping from RG. What else? Spiders. Spiders. Flying. What's up? Flying. Flying. Oh, was it death? And Beth, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> death. Which, thank you, Margie, brings <laughs> us to Jerry Seinfeld. I'm going out of frame for just a moment here. Sorry. Who said? According to most studies, people's number one fear is public speaking. Number two is death. <laughs> that means for most people, if you're at a funeral, they'd rather be in the coffin <laughs> than doing the eulogy. <laughs> so what is everyone so afraid of? Here's a few. Do any of those things resonate with anyone? I know for me, I thought that every time I got up to give a speech, it had to be epic. Like I had to wow like no one had ever wowed before. And if I didn't, I was a total failure. How about anyone else? What about any of these resonate? What do you think? Stupid yeah. and incompetent for sure. That says stupid and incompetent. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think earlier when you're asking if you like public speaking, my thought was like, well, it depends on what I have to talk about. <laughs> Shoes. <laughs> right. But if it's something I'm comfortable with, then I don't have as many of those fears. Okay. If it's something new. Yeah. yeah. Number one that I hear from clients and that I hear from most people is rejection. Hey, I mean, being up here, you all are a lovely, friendly audience. It's a pretty vulnerable position to be in. Hey, you're really putting yourself out there. And people just often don't want to do it. So with all of these lovely feelings that we could get from just having to be up here, why do we have to do this at all? Well, who of all of you entrepreneurs had ever pitched a client? Made a video to put on your website. So <laughs> 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 had, had to introduce yourself at the beginning of a rise presentation. Right? You're all you're all public speakers, and there are lots of really important reasons why we need to be able to communicate in a clear, compelling, and confident way. So it's so important in so many different ways. And today, I would like to share with you some things that I have learned in my 10 years as a New York City criminal prosecutor, being in court nearly every single day in front of judges, juries, opposing counsel who could not stop yelling at me, witnesses who didn't want to be there, and having to remain calm, cool, and collected throughout all of it and convince judges and juries who also didn't wanna be there to do some really difficult things. I'd also like to share some tips I've learned from doing 10 years of live television, where things just come at you 
How can you be clear and compelling? And finally, I'd love to share some tips from my time as an educator. Think of how this sounds, watching thousands of lawyers present on legal topics to other lawyers. Mm -hmm. I've experienced death by PowerPoint <laughs> more times than I care to think of. And my goal in being with all of you here today is that I give you at least one thing, one takeaway that you can leave with today and put into place in your communication so that your communication in all these different ways really shines. So let's start our countdown. Number five, first impressions matter. You heard of primacy. Has anyone heard that term before? Okay, I'm getting a couple, a couple nods here. It's the idea that the first thing we say is what people remember. When you hear the old cliche that you only get one chance to make a first impression, it's actually true. Right? And you don't have much time to do it. People tend to remember what they hear first. And so psychological experiments showed that when you give a list of words to people, they remember what they hear first. Then they may kind of tune out in the middle and we'll talk about the end when we get to the end of the presentation. Okay, so how are you going to grab that attention? Does anyone know how much time you have when you first start out to get someone's attention? Any idea? Seven seconds. Seven seconds we have. Seven seconds. 10 seconds from Liz, anyone else? Yeah, you're in the right ballpark. Two to seven seconds for people to make a first impression. Two to seven seconds, it's like nothing. Who's been to a presentation where the person gets up and says, hi, I'm Lori and I'm a communications coach. And today we're gonna to talk about public speaking. I have 12 slides, let's get started. <laughs> Who wants to run out of the room when they hear that, right? So what's, what's your hook, okay? What is your hook to connect? So how did I start? Seinfeld. Seinfeld. Mm -hmm. A question, right? Who likes public speaking? Mm -hmm. And what does that do between me and all of you? when I ask, right? It makes the connection, right? It builds rapport, we start to get connected and hopefully it makes you wanna learn more. There are so many fun ways to do this, okay? It can be a question, throw out a statistic, right? Um, it could be a prop, you know, if you're getting really creative, um, bring out a prop. Uh, what else could you do to start? How about a story? You know, get on up and, and start. One great way is imagine. Imagine you're getting up in front of a presentation and you're super nervous. What would you do to make it good? Okay. Or picture this. Okay. And you start to paint a picture for your audience. What it also tells your audience when you take the time to make a hook to really think about it is that you have put effort into what you want to share with them. Okay. And that makes them want to stick with you right? And learn more. So that's maybe what you're saying. Yeah, Margie. So quick question. Yeah. So basically operating with the assumption that your audience already knows who you are in the context of why they're there. Like they've already read your bio or right. your name and you don't have to share that at the beginning of the presentation. Yes. Um, generally, and I did think Anna Marie was going to introduce me. So <laughs> <laughs> that's where I would have come in. But yeah, generally your audience has already read your bio. They know who you are. Okay. They know why they're there. And the good thing about too is to ask someone to introduce you so that you don't have to do it. Ask someone to do it. Um, another way is I used to have a slide in here that talked about me and talked about more about what I did. Since my time is more limited, I took that out. Um, and assuming kind of I know a lot of you and, and you know, told you a little bit, you know, when I shared about being in the courtroom and doing other things and trying to give you a little background, but yeah, ask someone to introduce you. That way you have free reign to do what you want. And the hook's different than the introduction. I mean, there's two right. separate things, right? Right. We could do a whole thing on introductions, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's what you say, right? Those are the words. How about body language? Slumped over. Not so good, right? Looking up not at you, not so good. The studies show that you should have eye contact with people about 61% of the time to be impactful. So 
93% of communication is visual. And only 7% is about what you say or what you don't say. So in addition to having this great hook that you're starting out with, how about, how are you going to look? Where are you going to stand? And one thing that I advise clients that also helps with nervousness, stand right in the middle, take a deep breath, hands out. And I, I think we you know, may have heard this before that kind of having your hands out, not in your pockets, not behind you, forges that connection, less threatening to anybody. A little bit of silence before you start. Studies have shown that people listen most after two things. One of them is silence. Anybody guess what the other one is? Laughter. So I started with a little bit of silence. I tried my hand at a joke, somebody else's, but it worked. Okay, so that's what causes people to also listen in. Okay. Call it the triple threat. Your body is facing your audience, you have eye contact, your hands are out. And then you wow them with your hook. And then you got. Them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how do you do this well on Zoom? We'll get to that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, what I will say is the eye contact, okay, at the camera. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know where you're looking on Zoom. Yeah. The way that you frame yourself. Yeah. Um, and the same techniques of having this kind of hook, of having that eye contact, of being in direct connection with your audience. It's hard. Um, mm -hmm. It's so much harder, but we'll get to that okay. a little bit later and kind of delve into some of the videos and stuff. Thank okay, you. sure. All right, so we've done our hook. The audience is with us. <clears throat> what are we going to do now? Number four, let's tell a story. So if you follow any kind of communication or think about presenting, you have heard the word storytelling, right? It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right? Storytelling, storytelling. And it can sound very intimidating. Sorry, that was me. It can sound very intimidating. I don't even know what I did. I have no story to tell that. Um, it can be really intimidating, but we tell stories every day. Right? When you come home from work and you talk to your partner, you talk to your friends, say, this is what I did today. You're telling a story. When you read a book, maybe a child's book to your kids, if you have kids, you're telling a story. Even when we did our introductions this morning, you're telling a story. Some of them in presentations, they're more involved, right? But stories basically do not need to be complicated. Beginning, <clears throat> middle, and end. That's it. They need to be relevant. They need to be resonant to what you're presenting on. But they do not need to be long. So let me share with you one of my favorite stories. This is David Ditz, who, I'm going to spoil it, wins an Emmy for his role in Hamilton. <laughs> Tony goes to... Oh, Tony, sorry. David Ditz, Hamilton.
because people in our lives did that. So um, thank you, Mom and Dad, who are here tonight. Thank you. Tony, it's so good when <laughs> so what do you think? Mm -hmm. What do you think of that as an example of storytelling? What do you think of the story? Great. What made it great? I think the uh, the vivid tights, the <laughs> gymnastics routine. I like. I don't care about it. More acceptance speeches, and I was like, great. I like it. Mm -hmm. It's just the crowd you mm -hmm. Not a lot of. Anyone else? It seems so personal, right? And it's, it's really brought you into who he was. And the thing that I really love hearing everyone's perception is that everyone has a different thing that resonated with them with that story, mm -hmm. right? Just one little story hits people really different. I was going to point that you made about like just the first two weeks. Like when they say his name, he tries to like kiss his girlfriend and she doesn't go for it. And then he goes on stage, doesn't talk about her. And so <laughs> comfortable he's wearing his funky suit the hair is whatever he's smiling totally totally himself and that makes it resonate too the story also is that his dad remembers it totally differently than he did <laughs> um, but that you know it just shows that is what you can do nothing complicated has anyone heard these six words yeah annie tell us shortest it's like it won the novel for or won an award for the shortest novel ever written. Right. Annie said, Hemingway? It was Hemingway. It's yeah. attributed to Hemingway. Um, it was a con. It, Annie said it won the award for the shortest novel ever written. It was a contest to write a novel in six words or less. For sale, baby shoes never worn. It just evokes emotion. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? Oh, like it kind of breaks your heart. <laughs> I didn't get it at first. Yeah. For those of you in St. Louis, Beth says, oh God. <laughs> I didn't get it at first. She's got it now. Okay? Doesn't have to be epic or complicated. Right? It's right there. So I encourage you to think about stories that are resonant to you, things that have happened. Um, I think Liz shared in her introduction that she's been here for a month. She's already figured out her entire life and she's starting a shoe company. Perfect. Perfect. You beat W. Dibbs for time on that. I mean, awesome. There's a story. We just learned so much about her. And for those of us who love shoes, I mean, I, immediate connection. Okay. So some stories will be longer, but these are the qualities and, and the things to think about. And think about why you are telling the story, whether it's in a presentation, a meeting, an introduction. You need to know why. And if you get stuck, here is a trick. Something that can make stories really interesting is just looking at it in a different way, through a different lens. And that's the power of changing perspective. Okay? So who has heard of Wicked? Wicked, the show on Broadway, right? I have some hands here, right? The Wizard of Oz told from the perspective of the witches. Totally changed it around, whole new story. There is also um, a children's book, The Three Little Pigs, told from the, birth, from the lens of the wolf and what he thinks going to each house. It's actually really quite good. 
So if you get stuck in telling your stories, think about changing perspective. It can make all the difference. Any questions on stories and storytelling? Something we could also do a whole thing on. But they add real color and they really help you connect to your audience. So I encourage you to try. So we, we're out there, we've done our hook, we've pulled the audience in, we're telling these really resonant stories. How are we doing it? Are we taking our material and being creative and innovative and kind of thinking outside the box? Or are we reading our PowerPoints? Please tell me we're not reading our PowerPoints. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, Annie. Um, I have to give presentations in a couple months, and it's about why not to use, like, you know, the traditional blue background PowerPoint. And I was going to start with it, and I realized I can't because people stop watching. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I have to, like, figure out how to talk about it and then show it, and then, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. They might not stop watching if you started with it. But I do think almost like I, the way I talked about the introduction, bringing it in a little later could be much more impactful. Interesting. Who's tried something really bold and creative when they're talking? Yeah, actually. I, I did competitive speaking when I was in high school, and I'm terrible at it. And then I did it in college. <laughs> I did it in college just so I get exposure. And then um, I had a, a teacher help me rewrite the intro. I started it with a bird and asked for it. Like, how'd that feel to do it? <laughs> I felt like I was cheating because it was like, uh, in reference to Match, whenever mm -hmm. you, um, at the end of the series, they, um, the North Koreans are coming to like take over a village or whatever, and these people are hiding and being surprised. And your love was like, um, you were to kill the baby that you're holding to save everyone around you. And this, it was it was awful, but it felt like they're supposed to match. So worked. So good. <laughs> so for those of you in St. Louis, um, Ashley was sharing how she was a competitive speaker in high school and wasn't doing so great in it and then went into doing it in college and used a really dramatic story to start and how she did really well, got third place, but kind of felt like she was cheating a little bit. Megan. Oh, <laughs> um, look, people want to be engaged, right? And you can take some really, really amazing content. Maybe you all have seen this, I know I have, and destroy it <laughs> by being dumb. So here's a little example for you. And since Ashley told me I didn't do enough of the lead in, here's an example <laughs> of what can happen when you're not creative. Have you Mr. Do your worst, Doctor. I will. <laughs> Presentation. Hijacking us geothermal energy supply. <laughs> Phase one, choosing the right drawbit. The industry standard is a broken A7, permitting and zoning. Huge <laughs> headache. Phase 20, this is what I like to call triangle of trepidation. As long as evil villains reveal their plans, you can count on Geico saving folks money. It's going to pop to the employee. <laughs> so, the Geico commercial. Okay. Taking over the world and boring someone while you talk about it. Okay. Let's do the opposite. Okay, let's take any kind of content we have. And I have presented to lawyers, I've presented to accountants, I've presented to data scientists, and people invariably come up and say, how do I make what seems really dry interesting? You know what, for your audience, if they're there, they're interested in what you wanna hear, right? Like whatever, you know, Annie's gonna be presenting and talk about medical illustration, right? People who are there to see her wanna know all about this. They wanna dive into it, okay? So put that out of your mind. You're there to share, okay? And the people wanna hear what you have to say. So. How can you also just be creative? So here's an example of someone who was incredibly creative in her presenting. This is Emma Gonzalez. She was one of the victims of the Parkland shooting in Florida several years ago. She's speaking on the mall in Washington, DC. And just remember at the time, she's 16 years old. A 
and we're coming in about four minutes into her standing in silence at the podium. came out here, it has been six minutes and 20 seconds. The shooter has ceased shooting and will soon abandon his rifle, blend in with the students as they escape and walk free for an hour before arrest. Fight for your lives before it's someone else's job. What do you think? what she did. For those of you in St. Louis, we're totally silent here. Okay. I mean, it is an incredibly emotional thing that she's talking about. It's an incredibly emotional event that she was at. She had thousands of people both watching her on television and in person, and she chose to make the most impact, not with her words, but with her son. Yeah, it's an incredibly brave choice, especially when you're 16 years old and people were constantly coming up to her and tapping her and trying to get her to talk because they didn't understand what she was doing. She didn't tell anybody. Wow. I would imagine that none of you will forget watching that and none of the people who were there forgot it. And I've also watched that about a hundred times and I will have moved every single time. So you can use your words, you can use silence, you just think outside the box. You do not have to do it in any particular way. Your imagination is the only thing that will hold you back. Another example, take it down to a smaller platform on an issue that's also emotional is um, with COVID. There is a scientist who puts out um, some COVID information. And she really tries to talk to people in a very comfortable way about it. And she sits on her stairway at her home to do these videos. So she sits there and she talks to the camera and she puts out these videos in a super comfortable, super warm, super interesting and simple way to connect with her audience about this really important data that she's sharing. And she calls it the Stairway Chronicle. I think it's brilliant, um, and she really brings people in that way. Um, so I'll give you another example of something creative and fun that I saw. So I was at a conference facilitating 120 people, okay, and I had a group of about 10 people, and one of the guys in my group was really quiet, and he told me, oh, Lori, tomorrow I'm getting up, speaking to the entire group with the executive management there to share what my division is doing. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, what is this guy going to do? He said like three words in our facilitation. Um, I, I'm a little nervous for him, but okay. So on the day, he stands up and he goes up on stage and he's got some file cards and he looks at the audience and he says to them, okay, everybody here, if you are comfortable getting up in front of this audience and speaking, stay standing. If you're not, sit down. Okay, so good number of people sit down. And he went on, okay, if you are comfortable talking about the specifics of what my department does, stay standing, everybody else sit down. Okay, so everyone's doing this. And eventually he got to one person who answered all the questions, yes. And he said, wonderful, you're going to interview me. Come on up here. And she bounded up to the stage. He handed her the file cards. They sat up in their two tall chairs. Wow. And conducted a fantastic interview. <laughs> right? It was awesome. And I said to him after you told him how great that was. And I thought, that is so great. Can I share that story? Mm -hmm. And maybe one day I'll even do it. And he's like, Lori, absolutely. We're an open source tech company. It's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> but how great, right? Yeah. How great. By the time she bounded up there to interview him, he had the entire audience eating out of the palm of his hands. They couldn't wait to learn more. Okay. So just another idea. Um, think about some creative ways that you can do stuff. 
Yeah, Beth. I stole this idea from a high school presentation and I used it in one of my interpersonal classes that I teach in. The speaker came in and he dressed in full gang gear and was like in, did a presentation like, you know, the bandana, the big jeans, the whole thing. And then like, it was, it was about, I'm sure, perception and racism and like, all of that kind of stuff. And then halfway through, he took off all of the garb and was wearing like a regular suit underneath it. And like, I was 16 when this happened and I'll never forget it. Yeah. Yeah, so for, for those of you on Zoom, Beth was sharing that um, she saw a presentation where someone came in in full gang gear, mm -hmm. you know, fully decked out, shared his story mm -hmm. about various things and then took off the full gang gear to reveal that he had a suit on mm -hmm. underneath. And that it was an incredibly powerful way to present you know, material perception, about perception yeah. mm -hmm. and, and about gang violence mm -hmm. and other things, mm -hmm. and that she has never forgotten it. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm never going to forget it. That's yeah. really impactful. So there's so many things you can do. Um, I used to work for a company that did education for lawyer, the scene of my killing by PowerPoint for many years. And we had to teach ethics to lawyers. By the end of the year, they had to get continuing legal education credit. And so we had this captive audience because the lawyers had to be there, but they'd be on their computers and their board. We turned it into a game show. So we did an ethics game show. We had prizes, people came up, like we did Jeopardy, we did Family Feud, we did all this stuff. And it became this incredibly popular program so that the lawyers actually stopped waiting until December to do it and came during the year and the company got lots more business. And the lawyers were happier and they remembered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ashley. You're so much more creative, but like for people that can't, would get past an interrupted flow or something. Like mm -hmm. some people will just have a problem with the question, right? Like, do you recommend they kind of like keep the creativity like limited, I guess, in a way of like engaging so that they can kind of control the situation or? One thing that's fun about being creative is that it, it, you still do have control because you're the one who's decided kind of how you want to do it. I guess the question is, you know, if you're not feeling as creative and maybe you feel like you're going to lose flow because you're doing all these other things, then what do you do? You know, do you rein it in? And what I'd say is to only do what you're comfortable with. So doing kind of like the guy did at the big conference may not be your thing. Maybe your creativity is you know, not using a blue background in your PowerPoints, right? <laughs> <laughs> like Annie said, maybe that, yeah. that's where you are. Try little baby steps. Okay. Maybe your creativity is just starting a presentation in a new way, okay. like by asking a question or something. Just like feel what feels comfortable to you. Got it. Okay, does that make sense? 100%, yeah, absolutely. Lynn? Um, I was just gonna say too, like, I mean, yeah, like some of the creativity stuff, like you can actually do involvement with you. So I remember like in college, I did a presentation on hiking um, Mount Everest. And one of the things we did beforehand was we handed straws out to everyone in the mm -hmm. audience. And about halfway through, we told everyone to start breathing through their straws mm -hmm. because that simulates yeah. being at the top of Mount Everest. And it was kind of the same idea that I got from her. Like anything you can do to create a visceral reaction mm -hmm. from your audience, that's outside of just listening like some people i'm not very good at just listening like i need to keep drawing or yeah so sometimes if you can add aspects of that that adds creativity without requiring them to interact with you mm -hmm. yeah you know like they're doing it on their own or you can have them answer questions maybe not ask you but like writing it or drawing mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. yeah. you want your your main goal right your goal of any time that you're here, I'm out of the picture, sorry. Your goal of, of any time you're doing this, to have an impact and to have a connection with your audience, okay? And that can be as simple as, you know, if you can help it, don't speak from a podium. Don't have anything to, you know, put in, in between you and your audience. You want to be as connected as you can be. Um, it can be as simple as eye contact. Um, when I was trying cases, we had a Polaroid of some bullets that were recovered from a shooting. And I thought about blowing it up. And then I thought, oh, if I have the Polaroid, the judge is gonna have to let me get really close to the jury to show it to them. Mm -hmm. And he did. And so I was almost in the jury box with the jurors forming a connection as I showed them evidence. And it was just something tactical, mm -hmm. but it was something creative 
and something I felt was bold, even though, you know, it wasn't like an epic thing I was out there doing. It was just a small, quiet thing that had an impact. So I think, Ashley, small, quiet things wow. that can have an impact yeah. can add to comfort. I just wait about the <laughs> you won't get out of control. Yeah, we'll rein it in. We'll rein it in. All right. So we've done our hook, right? We're telling stories. We're being bold and creative in big ways and small, quiet ways that have an impact. This, I have to say, is one of my all-time favorite things to do when we are speaking in any way because everyone has something they don't like about themselves, especially when they get up in front of a group. Okay, so it's all about reframing. When I was trying cases, I could not control the fat patterns of things that came in, but I had to figure out a way to reframe it for a jury so that weaknesses could be looked at as strengths. Okay. And that I could control. So anybody have a weakness with their public speaking or with their presenting that they feel like it's something they have to deal with, that it's hard? That it throws them off. All right, I'll give you an example. <laughs> Who walks when they're talking? Okay, Lori Barr. It's a walker. Okay, Liz, I got a little walking. Okay, a little bit of pacing. Hands, hands everywhere. Some public speaking coaches might say, oh, you have to stand and you have to ha have your hands. How much energy is that going to take? for you to think about not walking and putting your hands down. How are you going to be able to be bold and creative and all these other things if all your energy is going to that? So I had a client who was a walker. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> I would get dizzy with him. Okay, so what we worked out was he would get up in, in the beginning of presentation and he'd say, I'm a walker, okay? And this is really distracting and this is what he'd be doing. I know I'm gonna walk. So what I'm asking you is, Try not to be distracted. If it gets super distracting, raise your hand. Let me know, because I don't even know that I'm doing it sometimes. But when you think I'm at 10,000 steps, raise your hand. <laughs> and the person who gets it is going to get, you know, a free session or whatever. Okay? So that's what he did. Mm. And it made mm. him calm, because then he wasn't worried about it. How about fast talkers? I, <laughs> I know that is a fast talker. Uh -huh. Margie, fast talking. Yeah. It's usually when I'm like excited about something, actually. It's not yeah. a nervous habit. So excited. Yeah. I get up right now, a million miles a minute. And yeah. that's not a weakness. Yeah, I think it's like a good thing. And I, I'm able to kind of make fun of it on mm -hmm. the spot with it. Exactly. And, which is exactly what I would advise doing. Like, call it out that you know that you're doing it. It's awesome. And that's exactly what I did. Client. So he's a young tech guy pitching a tech company. He's trying to get some, some investment in his company. Margie, this guy was not like the excited talking. Like Mar Margie said, she talks, you know, which gets really excited and talks. This was like, do you, I'm going to so age myself. Did anyone remember those Federal Express commercials where at the end, blah, 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 the guy talks uh, so fast? You could not understand a word he's saying. Okay, so we did everything. We tried all these different ways. We tried breathing. We tried meditating. We tried whatever. Nothing worked for him. So we said, you know, it's just going to happen. So what are you going to do about it? So he had a, kind of a plan B. He knew that there, he might get up in front of people he was pitching and be really nervous and just talk super, super fast. So what we said was, we're just going to let it happen. So he would just let it happen. Then he'd say, okay. It is so good we got that out of the way. <laughs> I can talk really fast when I'm excited. I'm super excited to be here. Now I will talk at a human pace so you can understand me. And then he'd do his pitch and he did great. So it also made a connection. You know, he exposed his vulnerability and he made that connection with people listening to him who then were just, you know, they were in it with him. So that worked. What do you all think of those? examples. Yeah, Annie. I like it. It makes me wonder if you've heard of this before. And because you speak in front of a jury, I'm guessing you have. But people that walk, I've heard that they will actually plan their walk path to tie into their presentation. So there was a lawyer that he would always walk to this side when he talked about his client for damages or something that they wanted the jury to sort of like feel good about. And then he would walk to the other side when everybody talked about negligence and he wanted the jury to be 
mad or to be like, this is bad. And he would just kind of work it into his flow, like a dance. I don't know if it works, but it's very interesting to almost like subconsciously tell the jury that when I'm on this side of the room, I'm talking about something good, and when I'm over here, I'm talking about something very horrible. Yeah, Annie, for those of you on Zoom, Annie's talking about um, attorneys who would kind of walk to one way in front of a jury to talk about good things and then maybe walk to another way to talk about bad things. And then it was almost subliminally or subconsciously putting it in their minds that when he was in a certain place, he was talking about a certain thing. That is like, you know, jury communication 375. Like that's super advanced to be yeah. doing it. Um, and I think people who do it. Um, yeah, there were, if I wanted to be telling the jury something that I really wanted them to listen to, I would come really close and talk quietly and they'd have to lean in. And if it was something else, maybe I was back. So yeah, yeah, people do. Yeah, for sure. Um, but those are some, you know, I think for that in particular, what Annie's talking about, it's not necessarily a weakness, it's a technique. Right. You know? Right. And I mean, you want to get but super. Like how you can turn that weakness mm -hmm. into strength is if you actually map out the walk. Right. Mm -hmm. You're like, you know, I'm not going exactly. to be walking, so let me just try and walk over here. Right. And walk over here. Mm -hmm. And what Annie's saying is, you can make that weakness into strength in a in a really good, technical and strategic way. If you're going to be walking, make it mean something. Yeah, like I was just talking earlier with some of the girls before we got in here, um, that one of my very first Zoom presentations. I have a standing desk and I keep a tennis ball <laughs> there to rub the aroma on my foot. And I was giving a Zoom presentation and I was like rubbing my foot on the tennis ball. And so all you can see is my head like just slightly moving back and forth. And I watched the video, I was like, I look crazy. Like, I'm crazy. I'm like, throw the tennis ball away and never be in here again. But I'm thinking how something like that I could have mm -hmm. turned into a strength or been a sub. Yeah. Something more. Yeah. yeah. Annie, uh, for those of you on Zoom, Annie was saying how much she gave, gave a Zoom presentation at her standing desk. She was rubbing her foot against the tennis ball. So I'm not doing it as well as she did. So she was like moving back and forth the whole time. And then it looked a little oh crazy when she, no when she noticed. And that maybe yeah. next time but she'll have a way of calling it. About it. It would be funny to talk say, about it. This is, you know, I have a standing desk. This is what right. I did, blah, blah, blah. And I'm injured. Exactly. Like, and then it would be funny. Maybe. And doesn't that you know, forge connection, right? Doesn't that show your vulnerability? Doesn't that kind of make your audience feel more connected to you and want to listen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had someone who had knee surgery presenting. She had her camera and the whole Zoom thing set up like on top of her stuff. Yeah. And in the middle of the person, the whole thing just oh, collapsed. Yeah. I mean, you could hear the, you know, it yeah. just, you could hear everything. And then, you know, like you just see like the floor right. from her camera. We gave her a few minutes. She came back and she was like, <laughs> so let me tell you about my knee surgery. So just like that, like you just, you make it work, yeah. right? No, it's boring to be perfect, right? It's boring to be perfect. Nobody feels super connected to people who don't show their humanity, their vulnerability. So I release you all from ever <laughs> feeling like you have to be perfect because you don't. <laughs> Uh, we talked a bit about, you know, just think about when should you confront that weakness? You know, do you do it kind of in the beginning? Do you maybe, you know, when Annie notices she's moving back and forth, then maybe she confronts it then. Um, really, whenever you're comfortable. And yeah, so it's just part of how being used. And that is kind of my number one advice is to just be yourself throughout all these techniques. Do what works for you. Um, when I was trying cases, I had friends who, I had one friend who's about six foot tall kind of large man and I'm five foot two he could get away with things in court that if I tried them I would look utterly ridiculous mm -hmm. I could get away with things in my style that would look ridiculous for him so you know if you haven't done a lot of speaking um and just think of each opportunity that you have every phone call every introduction um, all the networking we're going to do when this is over today and chit chat, as Anna Marie will tell us to any conversation you have is an opportunity to further get to know what's comfortable for you and what you're comfortable doing and just keep trying. So we are doing all these great things. We've done our hook. We're telling a story. We're being creative. 
we are reframing those weaknesses to kind of make them work for us and also using humor with that. Most of the time when you do that with weaknesses, you're going to get that humor in there and that's going to be a great connection and people are going to want to listen and learn more. Um, who feels comfortable using humor? I have a lot of hands here. That's awesome. I'm funny about six, like once every six months. My kids like <laughs> write, they write it down. They're like, mom is funny. See you in six months. So if you do feel comfortable, use it. It's so powerful. If you don't feel comfortable, try it and see if people laugh or don't use it. Okay. We're at the end. We are at the end. So remember primacy we talked about in the very beginning? The counter to that is recency. <laughs> People remember what they hear first and what they hear last. So start strong and strong. The same things that you can use to hook people in the beginning, you can use at the end. And if you can, what I call bookend it, tie it together, even better. Okay. So ask a question, use a fun number, use a prop, tell a story. Um, Liz talked about um, someone using straws in a presentation to breathe through and give the um, effect of what it might feel like to right, be at high altitude or something like that. Do a demonstration, okay? Who comes to a presentation at the end and the presenter says, okay, thank you so much. Any questions? <laughs> right? So risky. So risky, right? Yeah. yeah. I love questions at the end. And I actually say, I think that everyone in the audience, especially with all attorneys, I'm like, attorneys learn better from other attorneys. So an attorney is going to ask a question that the other attorneys are going to learn more from than something I've said. Mm -hmm. So I always say, bring them on because yeah. you guys are going to learn more from each other than from what I've said. I'm not, yeah, I'm not, and Annie shared that she feels that a lot of lawyers learn from questions, so she wants the attorneys to bring on the questions. I'm not saying not to do questions and answers. Well, yes. Yeah. Well, because people will be crazy with their questions. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Well, well, yeah. well, I, I feel like we're all learning from each other with these questions and with the interaction. But when you are at the end of a presentation or a talk, mm -hmm. You have control over how you want to leave your audience. What, how do you want to leave them? What emotion do you want them to leave the room with? What impression do you want to give? You control that. And if you end with any questions, you have ceded that control to your audience and you have no idea what's going to happen. Like, for example, I will end this presentation if Anna Marie will give me about two to three minutes to do it. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Love taking questions throughout and will absolutely stay and take any questions, but I wouldn't end it with any questions. Okay. Don't give up that power. I mean, how every so many people, I think it is one of the easiest ways to have an impact to end with whatever you want to leave your audience with because you've pulled them in all this way. You've been bold, you've been creative, you've told stories, you've done all this stuff and worked so hard. Why are you just gonna give it up at the end? Okay. Yeah, my, Beth. My friend, she's a waitress and she said if she like got busy and didn't do a great job serving her table at the end, she would go up and like, like right before she gave the bill or as she's giving the bill say, I'm so sorry, like I didn't, you know, I we were busy and slammed. I didn't mean to give you less and it worked every time to get like a good tip. <laughs> so Beth, for those of you on Zoom, Beth said that Beth said she has a friend who's a waitress who, if she didn't do such a great job and she was um, serving people, would put recency uh -huh. into effect to really good effect at the end and would go up and apologize and talk with them and say, I'm so sorry I didn't do a great job, but you know, really make an impression. And it worked because she got free tips. Mm -hmm. Great example. <laughs> yeah. So it's also fun. Yeah, Margie. So I was just thinking it's the same way at the beginning. You said someone could introduce you and that kind of checks the mm -hmm. box. You could apply that same mindset to the end is where you can naturally give a PowerPoint like you're ending with a bang and something really meaningful, but then it goes to a slide that says group discussion. Where yeah. it's, it's inviting that process to happen without the ending actually saying, does anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. Right. Like 
I mean, perfect. Perfect. just there because I know from running, running women's group programs, a lot of times they say, oh my gosh, our group discussions have been game changing. Or like, I love them from my peer, right? That can still happen. And yeah, Mar Margie was adding, which is really valuable, that you can end with a bang, you right. know, however you want to end really powerfully, and then maybe have a slide questions or group discussion. She's talking about leading women's groups and the group discussions are so powerful. So kind of right, maintain your power and your control and the way you want to end and then kind of have that transition into group discussion. Yeah, absolutely. I'm saying just keep those things in. It's just a matter of where you want to put them and how you want to do it. And you'll tell me, Margie, how I do at the end of this. Okay. <laughs> Come on, trying something new. So you'll let me know. Okay. So if anybody said, what are your biggest things that you can tell someone that will improve any kind of presentation in a super easy way? Start strong and strong. Think about things that you've seen. People don't do it. They don't do it. Um, and it's a really great way to kind of elevate and wow your communication, okay? And to have fun with it. I mean, I think we skip over a little bit that ultimately this should be fun. You know, you're out there, you're communicating your ideas, you're sharing all the value that you all have, which is a really um, fun and wonderful opportunity to have. So ultimately, you know, try to enjoy it in some way because then your audience will too. And you can make even more of an impact. So any questions on any of that? Okay, so my goal, as I told you in the beginning, was to give you just one thing that you, you, I, you know, I'm not getting this picture right, sorry. Not standing in the tape that Anna Marie gave me. <laughs> leave you with one, one thing, one takeaway that you could leave with today and put into your communication. So can anyone share a takeaway that they might take away from this presentation and use in something coming up? Yeah, I like Ashley. The silence, the power of silence. I never really thought about that. Just, you know, you can't worry about like filling in dead noise or whatever, but it's not radio. So like, not losing yeah. money, but building an impact. And the way you do it is really consistent too, which is a very intentional process. Yeah. Ashley. You kind of like lean your head back a little like you're still doing the physicality aspect of it. I'm sorry. I love it. I'm going to have Ashley come in and give me feedback on everything. I'm learning so much. Um, for those of you on Zoom, Ashley shared silence is her takeaway and being really intentional about it, not having to fill the air. I did embrace silence, embrace the pause. It is like white space on paper. It is so powerful. Okay. Any other takeaways? Yeah. Annie. Starting with the personal story. Uh, starting with a personal story. What else? Yeah, Liz. I mean, maybe just the idea of like two to seven seconds to basically start with that hook or that story <laughs> in order to get your audience in. Yeah. Liz sets two to seven seconds to get your audience in. So use it. Yeah, Lori. Well, I've learned so much <laughs> and I do presentations all the time and I'm sitting here like, oh my God, that's it. Walking back now. Um, I've got a lot of room to grow. Um, the start strong and end strong, I think is really critical and I don't always do that well. So I definitely need to hone that. And you can do it on, Lori says, start strong and strong. Um, and we didn't get to go into it too much. Mm -hmm. So you and I can continue that conversation. You can do that on video too. You really can. Any, yeah, anybody else in takeaways? I just think be bold. And, I mean, the idea of creativity being so broad, like the guy that had the person in the audience interview him, like, that's awesome. mind-blowingly <laughs> brilliant. And like, yeah. positions him as like an expert public speaker when that's not at all what he was, in yeah. theory. But he was, because right. he was he found his way to communicate with that. Yeah, that said bold and creative. And the story about the guy who used the, the file cards and got somebody to come up and interview him. Yeah. Yeah. I, I dream of that kind of creativity. It's so fantastic. So I am so glad you all are taking away some things. I just encourage you to try them. Um, public speakers, people who are good at it, they get there through practice, through preparation, and through working really hard to have excellent content. Okay. The people who look like it's totally natural and easy are the people who have practiced and prepared for hours and hours and hours. You can do it. 
you can learn it. These takeaways that you just shared are things that you can put into effect right away to make your communication shine even more. And so I'm gonna leave you with a story. Anybody know who that is? Michael Jordan. Okay, so I live with a 14 year old teenager, my son, um, and he loves basketball, loves, loves, loves basketball. So I have learned more about basketball than I ever thought I would learn. And they're always talking about Michael Jordan and then we talk about Steph Curry and then we talk about LeBron and we argue back and forth over who's the best right now. It is Russell Westbrook. He is the absolute best. And he has been, yeah, he has been begging me to go see each and every one of these. He's gonna bankrupt me with all the basketball games that he wants to go to. So Michael Jordan, who did not make his high school basketball team, right? I see some knots. So, I encourage you all, just try, okay? Take away some of these things and just try one thing. Try it, have fun with it, learn from it. It's not gonna be perfect the first time. It may never be perfect, but it's really going to enrich and change the way you communicate and put your ideas out there. And I am sure you all are going to be fantastic at it. So I'm gonna leave you with the words of Michael Jordan as some encouragement as you move forward with all these ways to wow with your communication. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. And I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game when it shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. Go take those shots. I wish you great success. And if any of you would like to continue this conversation, um, Anna Marie is going to be sending out a link after today um, to some office hours I'll be holding. So if you have a presentation coming up, a meeting, an introduction, you just want to continue the conversation and talk about some things and get tips and techniques, I am offering some office hours on Friday and then next Wednesday um, here at RISE or on Zoom for all of you um, in St. Louis, depending on location and comfort. So um, I'd love to chat with you all more. And thank you so much. Thank you everyone for coming and uh, you know getting through the storm to be here. It was really awesome and really impressed with the turnout. We had tons of people on Zoom too. So I will be sending an email to all of you with Lori's office hours. If you want to sign up, it's going to be here at Rise or like she said, virtually too. Um, our next program event is going to be on the first and that's going to be in St. Louis with Michelle Stockton. It's going to be really great too. Um, feel free to stick around and you know hang out, ask questions, mingle, do whatever you want to do. Um, also another thing, um, because of the storm and because since I'm the only one in, in the office today and I have a doctor's appointment later, we are going to be closing at 3.30. Um, so just so everyone is aware, unless you have 24 hour access, then you can stay. But other than that, that is it. <laughs> Let's give it up for Lori one more time. Yay.